It's a good time to remind ourselves to recollect our hearts and our senses and uh, the fact that, you know, it doesn't happen automatically. The graces God wants to give you and the preparation of your heart for the year to come and the transformation that he wants to work in you um, isn't isn't just going to happen to you like uh, something magical or like taking a drug that it requires requires your effort it really is exercise it's like it's like they say uh, there's a number in the catechism about the sacraments themselves that even though the grace is um, you know there ex opere operantis, meaning that it operates in the fact of the sacrament happening regardless of what the person thinks or does. It still impedes you receiving all the graces God wants to give you if you receive it unworthily or if you receive it distracted or if you don't prepare yourself well. So that applies to our prayer. When when we we go to prayer, the amount that I'm truly engaged and truly apply my heart to to what is happening there permits the graces to flow more. It's like the wound of the hemorrhage touching Jesus' cloak with faith. Okay, so today we are going to meditate on the raising of Lazarus. What I think is most amazing about this story is the fact that at the end of the story, the Jews are so frustrated, the, the leaders of the Jews are so frustrated with Jesus that they, uh, they want to kill him. Not only that, but they want to kill Lazarus too. <laughs> Which is absolutely absurd. <laughs> because Jesus just raised Lazarus from the dead. So what is killing him going to do? <laughs> you know, you think they must have been shaken in their boots at some point. Like, okay, how do we deal with this? Being able to raise people from the dead kind of thing. You think that at some moment it didn't occur to them that Jesus also could have raised himself from the dead? You know? It's like, he's raising people from the dead. Let's kill him! Okay, that's really logical. You know? it's like, <laughs> uh, and it's another, another step on Jesus' way to his passion. Because at this point in the story, he's getting very close. And this is one of those chief aggravating moments for his enemies, for those who would eventually put him to death. And then I think that the greatest message of this passage of the raising of Lazarus from the dead is uh, Jesus' friendship. His friendship with them and his love, his deep driving love. His love that urges him to do more for the beloved. That's what we're going to contemplate when we get to the passion, the driving love of Christ, urging him on. The love that St. Paul says urges us on. Caritas Christi. The love of Christ driving him on step by step. And then again, another theme here is his power even over death and his power, the power of his voice and of his word, that commanding a dead man. Which is more amazing? Commanding the wind and the sea or commanding someone who has already died with his voice? The eardrums of Lazarus were not functioning anymore. It means that the voice of Christ went beyond moving sound waves. <laughs> right? Where did it go? Where did it echo? Oh, I just love it. I love this meditation. I hope you do too. And then, and then there's a beautiful contemplation to do in Mary and Martha, too, because of their, like, unwavering faith 
in Jesus. That's one of the big themes. Four themes, friendship, his, his driving love, his power and the power of his, his word, and then Mary and Martha's faith. There's not much to contemplate in Lazarus in this one. He's just dead. But, but so I really invite you to, to dive into it. I don't have any stories for you on this one. It's such a beautiful story in itself. There's the scene of Mary and Martha beside the sick bed. Contemplate their worrying and their fear and their virtue of trusting in Jesus. They realize that he's really sick. They say, you know, we don't like to bother Jesus, but but we really need him, and he really is the one who can save Lazarus. So let's send somebody to, to get him. And there's something mysterious here is that they probably really believed that Jesus would come right away. They probably really were certain and had strong faith that Jesus was going to, you know, out of friendship and out of love for them, was going to drop everything and go. But he did not. So you can contemplate them by the by his by his deathbed. Because Jesus wasn't there yet when he died, right? So the moment that they moments along the way where they announce how sick he is and how he's getting worse. And maybe there's a doctor there or someone who's an expert who says, Well, if Jesus doesn't come now. He's not going to make it. He's only got a short time left. And imagine them the moment that they announce that he's, he's died. And their hearts are just broken. Torn to pieces. But they never, not for a moment, do they begin to hate Jesus or to stop believing in him. So often we are broken by our being let down by others that we've trusted. They could have easily turned that into a wound of abandonment. Jesus has abandoned us. So just try to imagine what's going through their heads. Maybe the temptations, maybe the lies that they're hearing that Jesus isn't all that good. Maybe he didn't love you the way you thought he loved you. Maybe he's just forgotten about you. You thought he loved you so much and he abandoned you. You can't trust anymore. And somehow both of them have this incredible strength to be able to continue trusting in Jesus. Maybe they're tempted to doubt his ability, his power. You see, he couldn't really save him. He couldn't really do it. You thought he could do all things, but he could not. And then um, you can read it through, read through it. It's, I didn't mention it's John 11, the whole, almost the whole chapter of John chapter 11. But just read through that part where Jesus arrives and and they run out to him one by one and the different conversations that they have with him. And their profession of faith, even without knowing what it fully means, without knowing what he's fully talking about, it's like an ascent to, to saying, Jesus, you know what's best. You are right. I don't understand, but you're right. Very beautiful faith. And then capture those moments of deep sorrow. Death is one of the greatest expressions of the messed upness of the world. I think I used the word messed upness at the beginning when we were talking about sin and how the world ended up after sin entered the world and the incarnation and why God had to come because the world was messed up really bad. And death is probably the greatest expression.
It's the fruit of man's rebellion. It's the fruit of letting sin in the world. It's the fruit of uh, choosing to stop trusting in God. Remember the book of Genesis? The Catechism says, Adam and Eve let trust for God die in their hearts. So the fruit of that is death. What an incredible irony that in the midst of the death of their brother, Mary and Martha do not let trust die in their hearts. It's like they are healing what was done with Adam and Eve through their trust. And I think there's something beautiful in the fact that Jesus is doing this, having this interaction with them, facing the death of his friend when he's on his way to Jerusalem and on his way to his own death. He's already got that in his mind. He looks at death not as something to be feared or something uh, horrific that breaks him or that will break him someday. He looks at it as the enemy that he is going to conquer from within. Like that image from Father John Ricardo on the Kerygma. He is the ambush predator. He's like the Trojan horse to get on the inside and destroy from within. In a way, I think this gospel passage is about Jesus looking death in the eye, the way he looked the storm in the eye, facing it man to man. I'm not afraid of you. So Jesus even though he's on his way with confidence and with determination to his own death, feels all of the human feelings. He's got no fear and there's no enemy that can defeat him. And yet he experiences 100% the loss of a friend and the compassion of his two friends who have just lost their brother the empathy. He's deeply, deeply into it. And there's three times there where it mentions Jesus' feelings. Once where he's moved deeply and another one where it just says, Jesus weeps and Jesus wept. It might be the shortest verse in the Bible. Just those two words. And Jesus wept. That's what we want to contemplate. We want to get into that scene. We want to feel it with him. We want to understand the compassion and the love of his heart. That he cares so much about individual human beings that he's moved to weep. Arguably, he cares more about Lazarus or Mary or Martha or anyone he cares more about them than any other person has ever cared about someone because his heart is is that good that capable of loving I think that Jesus shows us that he doesn't take death lightly he doesn't take death lightly and therefore he doesn't take any of our problems lightly he could have he could have gone towards his death with like this kind of flippant attitude like, ah, death isn't a big deal for me. I'm going to rise from the dead anyways. You know? Same thing here. He could have gone to Lazarus's tomb laughing, saying, ah, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. I'm going to raise him from the dead. But he did not. He got fully into the human experience, suffering, pain, sorrow, loss. So what are my problems that are really hard for me. Whatever they are, Jesus faces it with absolute seriousness. He takes my problems seriously. We all know what it's like to try to like open up to someone about something that matters to us and have them like crack a joke about it or something, you know? Jesus 100% feels what we feel, understands what you 
are going through and embraces it fully, the full human experience. So just replay that scene where he, where he, he stops outside the tomb and he weeps. And then the scene where he looks up, he's done his weeping and maybe he's, maybe he's still got emotion in his voice. And he says, roll the stone away from the tomb. And people are like, what? What? Yeah, roll the stone away from the tomb. There will be a stench. He's been there for four days. And then they see that he means it and that they're serious. He's serious. And they do it. And then that moment of his voice his voice, commanding. Yeah, it's just crazy. Even if you thought you were a great miracle worker, would you go up to someone who was dead and speak to them? <laughs> and Jesus knows what he's doing. He's the Lord of life and death. He knows where Lazarus is right now, where his soul is what his soul is seeing and doing and thinking and hearing. And he uses his human voice. So it's not just a human voice. Lazarus, wherever he is, hears, hears the voice. Lazarus, come forth. And his soul is reunited to his body and he rises up. Yeah. Stumbles out of the tomb with a burial cloth on his face hands okay and then and then it might be kind of distracting I find it distracting to think about what Lazarus was feeling at that moment <laughs> yeah. like a little stiff maybe I don't know but 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 look at Mary and Martha look at their jaws drop and they're and they just like keep weeping even more <laughs> they start crying even more but because of joy and they run to Lazarus and they're like hugging him too much. And, and everyone is crowding around him, right? Everyone would definitely be crowding around Lazarus and pulling off, they're pulling off the cloths and they're like, is it okay to touch him? And, and touching him like, you know, like, are you a ghost? And, 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 he's, and he's alive and real and they're, and they're just overjoyed. So there's a whole moment who knows how long it was when everybody was focused on Lazarus and then at some point you know somebody realizes Jesus is the one who did this and they turn around and look at Jesus yeah. <laughs> and it's just like what, what would be in the heart of Mary and the heart of Martha once one of them realizes that he's just standing there, like smiling. <laughs> and uh, the gratitude. It's too much. So I invite you to spend time just bowing down before Jesus as he stands there, adoring him and loving him. You know, maybe you can imagine one by one, they make eye contact with Jesus and start crying again. And the whole crowd eventually turns to Jesus. I can't believe it. And I think some of them are thinking to themselves, you are God. You are God. There is no doubt anymore. You can do all things. And I just invite you to make that prayer, continue that prayer. Lord, I am totally yours. I will go with you wherever you go and do whatever you ask. 
I'm not afraid of anything as long as I'm in your service.